spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, his two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Thursday, September 26th, we are studying Numbers chapter 2, verses 1 to 34. In today's text, the Lord directs his people how they are to arrange themselves in their camp around the tent of meeting. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Andrew Preuss. Pastor Preuss serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in New Haven, Missouri. Pastor Preuss, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Thanks for having me back. So we get started today, Pastor Preuss. Talk to us a little bit about the book of Numbers. We've only read the first chapter so far. What should we know as we prepare to look at chapter 2? Yeah, so the book of Numbers is, well, it's called Numbers because it is about the organization of the people of Israel. Uh, and uh, it starts off with a census, with just kind of a general census of the of, of the, the, the tribes and the, the households of Israel, counting uh, the young men 20, 20 years and up of military age. And then chapter two does the same thing. It has the same number uh, of, uh, of military age men but this time it gets into more detail about how they are to be arranged for when they leave, for when they march, um, and, uh, and they're surrounded by the temple. So it is, it's interesting how the temple is at, you know, it's at the center, as we'll talk about, uh, and, and this is part of their worship. But they're also, it's also very significant that they are, they're being numbered in a military kind of way hmm. um so they're being conscripted uh and and this shows that the the church in its in in its earthly existence is uh we call it the church militant uh it must withstand the attacks of the devil the world and the sinful flesh and this is what we get into then in in the book of numbers we get into a lot more of these kinds of uh uh, attacks, not just physical military attacks, but we find that they're very spiritual attacks, especially when we get into, uh, you know, Balaam, uh, the the uh, King Balak uh, trying to, of, of Moab, trying to get Balaam to curse the people of Israel. But we also have internal attacks uh, that, that happen within them. We get into Korah's rebellion. Uh, then we, we also have the, the attacks of the flesh where they're afraid to go into the promised land when God uh, calls them to go in, and uh, and they don't listen to Caleb and Joshua. So what we're what we're being set up here for the first few chapters is the 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 the, the kind of order and rank of how God is setting all of the people of Israel up for when they need to leave. And eventually then, I believe it's chapter 10, when finally they break camp and they leave Sinai uh, and, and, and they follow the glory cloud. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, the, so right now we're just kind of getting started. We're, 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 we're looking at the, the initial arrangement of the, of, of the order of the people of the 12 tribes. And, 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 and yet there is something to say about that order. There's something significant about how God arranges all of it. Hmm. I think just the fact that God arranges and orders is significant. And I appreciate the way that you connected that to the spiritual attacks that are coming later in the book of Numbers. Perhaps it's our American context in which... It seems that, that many American Christians think that things should be spontaneous, and that's the way that God would work. But I think, from what you're saying, actually God orders his people and provides that order here in Numbers and still for his church, precisely for the sake of preparing us for the spiritual attacks. And it's maybe when we're being more spontaneous about things that we're more open and, and susceptible to those attacks of the devil. Yeah, that's a really good point. That, yeah, God... and. and 
this is, you know, we get into, we often talk about the three estates that uh, God has set up on earth for us to live in. We live within the home and the home has an order to it. Everyone plays a certain role in it. Everyone has a certain rank. Uh, we have the we have the estate of the civil the civil estate where we all live within uh, earthly authorities, um, and we obey and carry out various earthly authorities. And of course, we live within the church, which from a you know the, it's, the church is most properly speaking the spiritual uh, kingdom of Christ by which he. He rules us by his word of grace uh, and, and, and through, his, through his gospel and sacraments. Um, but there's also a structure even within the church where, where each part of the body plays a different role. Uh, and so when you consider the, the regular kind of taking your stand, taking your positions, uh, that, that's kind of what you're doing most of the time. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you're recognizing your station in life according to the Ten Commandments. Yeah. And, uh, and this prepares you for your spiritual battles. Um, so it can seem kind of boring. Uh, it can seem kind of mundane. Um, but these are, these are the training grounds uh, so that when the attacks do come, you, are, you, you know where to go. You know, so... You know, it's like, it's like, uh, uh, you know, it should be a natural thing for for a child that when he has a question or even a crisis in faith, uh, that he would go to his mom and dad and ask them, and that they would try to help him understand this from the scriptures, uh, and that they would then go to their pastor and ask him, you know. Uh, they're not, you're not necessarily doing that all the time. Uh, but what are you doing all the time? Well, or at least what you should be doing is you get up, maybe you have breakfast together, or at least have some meal together, dinner together, you, you, you have a routine, you go to church together, right? Um, and, uh, and, and so the, 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 that, that regular habit of getting in order, uh, gives you it, it, it's 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 like encamping right uh it's it's like an encampment so that when the attacks come you're ready and that's that's how god prepares you and you know it reminds me of psalm 34 where it says that the angel of the lord encamps around those who fear him um and that's what what that's what's being described here uh is uh is that god is encamping around his people yeah. uh, even as he has them each stand uh, in his own uh, station, or what is the word that he uses? Uh, he well, well, we'll hear it when you read it. But uh, but yeah. So anyway, the okay. he, he, he kind of stands in his own in his own station. Yep, yep. Very good. Let's take a look at the text. This is Numbers chapter two. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, "The people of Israel shall camp each by his own standard." With the banners of their fathers' houses, they shall camp facing the tent of meeting on every side. Those to camp on the east side toward the sunrise shall be of the standard of the camp of Judah by their companies, the chief of the people of Judah being Nashon, the son of Amminadab, his company, as listed, being 74,600. Those to camp next to him shall be the tribe of Issachar, the chief of the people of Issachar, being Nethanel, the son of Zuar, his company, as listed, being 54,400. Then the tribe of Zebulun, the chief of the people of Zebulun, being Eliab, the son of Helon, his company, as listed, being 57,400. All those listed of the camp of Judah, by their companies, were 186,400. They shall set out first on the march. On the south side shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben by their companies, the chief of the people of Reuben being Elizur, the son of Shadur, his company is listed being 46,500. And those to camp next to him shall be the tribe of Simeon, the chief of the people of Simeon, being Shelumiel, the son of Zurishadai, his company is listed being 59,300. Then the tribe of Gad, the chief of the people of Gad being Eliasaph, the son of Raul, his company is listed being 45,650. 
All those listed of the camp of Reuben by their companies were 151,450. They shall set out second. Then the tent of meeting shall set out with the camp of the Levites in the midst of the camps. As they camp, so shall they set out, each in position, standard by standard. On the west side shall be the standard of the camp of Ephraim by their companies, the chief of the people of Ephraim being Elishama, the son of Amihud. His company is listed being 40,500. And next to him shall be the tribe of Manasseh, the chief of the people of Manasseh being Gamaliel, the son of Petazor. His company is listed being 32,200. Then the tribe of Benjamin, the chief of the people of Benjamin, being Abidan, the son of Gideonai. His company is listed being 35,400. All those listed of the camp of Ephraim by their companies were 108,100. They shall set out third on the march. On the north side shall be the standard of the camp of Dan by their companies, the chief of the people of Dan being Ahiezer, the son of Amishadai, his company as listed being 62,700. And those to camp next to him shall be the tribe of Asher, the chief of the people of Asher, being Pagiel, the son of Akron, his company as listed being 41,500. Then the tribe of Naphtali, the chief of the people of Naphtali being Ahira, the son of Enon, his company is listed at being 53,400. All those listed of the camp of Dan were 157,600. They shall set out last, standard by standard. These are the people of Israel as listed by their fathers' houses. All those listed in their camps by their companies were 603,550. But the Levites were not listed among the people of Israel as the Lord commanded Moses. Thus did the people of Israel. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so they camped by their standards, and so they set out, each one in his clan, according to his father's houses. And that's the text, Numbers chapter 2, verses 1 to 34. Uh, Pastor Price, before we start looking at the, the various arrangements of the people, standard by standard, I want to talk about the arrangement in general. You have the tent of meeting in the middle, and you have the tribes camped around them, and yet, the people are facing the tent of meeting rather than facing outward. And I think that says something about who's protecting whom here. You think about the, the phrase circling the wagons. That, that phrase refers to the idea that you circle the, the wagons around whatever's most important in order to protect it. Here you have the most important thing on the, the inside, but I don't think we're, we're really envisioning the people on the outside protecting the tent of meeting. I think the tent of meeting is, is what's protecting the people of Israel, as you referenced from Psalm 34 earlier about the Lord encamping around. So he's doing that even though he's in the middle of the people around him. Yeah, we, we can't lose sight of the, how significant the, uh, the, the story and the, the, the kind of... Um, progression of the account of the Exodus is. So if, if you go back to, to Exodus, you know, you, of course, that is the story of God taking his people out of Egypt. And, and then uh, when he takes them to the wilderness of Sinai and to Mount Sinai, he gives the law. And then they break the law with the golden calf. And, um, but, but what goes all the way back to uh, to, to God's promise to Moses is that he would dwell with his people. Uh, and, and, and this is what Moses, in fact, says to Pharaoh. He doesn't just say, let us go full stop just to kind of do whatever. Like, uh, you know, like we're just, we're just an autonomous people. And that's why we should be, uh, he doesn't appeal to some, he doesn't necessarily appeal to some, uh, human right that they shouldn't be slaves although you know i think that you could make a case if you if, you know you cer certainly can make that case against slavery um of a people uh but 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 moses even though he is the lawgiver, doesn't make that appeal the appeal is that we would go out into the wilderness to worship the lord that's the whole goal that's what drives them out of egypt is to worship god uh, and so finally, it culminates at the very end of Exodus in chapter 40, where the people are, you know, they're, they're, they're repenting of, in repentance, they show the great fruit of repentance by providing for the, uh, for the tabernacle, for the construction of the tabernacle. And then they finally 
they finally set up the tabernacle in chapter 40. And what happens? The glory of God fills the tabernacle. And that's, you know, so, so, uh, so it ends by saying um, just the last verse of Exodus. Um, I'll just read it. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day mm -hmm. and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. And that is, that is the, the main detail that should stick out as you read the rest of uh, the books of Moses. Now, it's easy for people to forget that when you, if you're reading from Genesis on um, chronologically, because, you know, then you get into Leviticus and you have some things that happen in Leviticus, like uh, uh, Nadab and Abihu, you know, dying in the fire. You have, uh, but then you have all of these, you have all of these, uh, you know, regulations for the for the priests and for the sacrifices and for clean and unclean and all that kind of stuff. And then now in numbers, you get into much more of a narrative, much more of the accounts. But when you get back into, you kind of uh, hit the ground running again in numbers, you got to go back to the end of Exodus and, 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 and ask, okay, what is the main, what's the main point? What's the, what's the main detail? And the main detail is that God is in their midst and, and that he dwells in the sight of all the house of Israel, of all the houses of Israel. So, so this is, this is the, the entire book of Moses, all the books of Moses, the whole Torah is about them worshiping God. And so it makes perfect sense that they would all be facing God. And I like the, I like that, that, that distinction that you make there, that it would seem as though they are protecting the the tabernacle and in a sense they are you know there is a guarding of it and jesus says blessed are those who hear the word of god and keep it or guard it right um lord grant while worlds endure we keep its teachings pure throughout all generations you know that's certainly what they are doing they are guarding the temple or the tabernacle but they're also their their eyes are always toward the lord as the psalmist says and why are they always looking at the tabernacle? Why are they always facing it? Because once that glory cloud moves, then they know that it's time for them to move. So they, so their entire, their marching orders are given <laughs> right in the middle of them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we see that, we see that later on how the, the, the role that the Levites played, the Levites didn't go out to war with them. The Levites would be the first people that they would go and consult uh, before they went to war and after they came back from from battle. Uh, we see this later on, you know, with uh, uh, like how Moses and Eliezer tell them uh, that they they didn't uh, they didn't put to death the Moabite women, for example, who led them into uh, idolatry. Um, this is much later, I think, in chapter 31 or something like that. Um, so we see examples of this, how the, the Levites are, they, they continue to be that, 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 you know, when you get back from battle, it, it's the custom to go and be, and, and, and consult with the Levites or a man of God. I mean, we see this much later on many years from, from this time, uh, with Jehoshaphat, when Jehoshaphat goes to war against the against the syrians with uh northern israel and he 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 forms an alliance with ahab who is a syncretist um basically a pagan and then he and then jehoshaphat comes back from battle and he's rebuked and i believe he's rebuked just by a prophet uh he i can't remember if the guy is also a priest but nonetheless that is kind of that's the way that things go in scripture that you know they go to battle but they're always going to battle relying on the word and if they're not relying on the word then it doesn't go well for them and that's why even jehoshaphat who's a pious man even though he's kind of weak he'll ask like oh well is there a couple occasions where he asks well is there a word from the lord right is there a prophet who can speak to us before we go into battle um and so whenever they come back they always then consult with with the either the prophets or the priests who are going to tell them uh what god's word says right and that's a great uh that th this teaches us then how our daily life 
you know, whether we're soldiers or we're just ordered in our various stations in life, that our daily life is one of constant worship, constant looking to the Word of God um, uh, uh, to give us guidance, um, also to give us strength by the promises of God and, and the assurance that God dwells in our midst. Um, and so when we return, uh, when we return from whatever we're doing, that we then we, we, we look again to what God's Word says. This, by the way, is why, uh, you know, when we, when you get home from work, you should have dinner with your family, right? And when you have dinner, if you can, uh, you should have a devotion. You know, the father should lead their families in devotion. Well, what, is, what are you doing there? You're doing the same thing that God had Israel do, is that you are at the center of your life after you break camp and then after you come back. As, as, as Moses says in Deuteronomy, you know, when you get up, when you go, when you lie down, when you when you walk on the way, you know, that these words would be in your heart and that you would always be looking uh, for uh, what the word of God tells you to do, because that's that's the main thing. That's why God dwells with them. He doesn't just he doesn't just dwell with them so that they would just see his marvelous glory. I mean, it certainly was marvelous, but that was a glory that was passing away. Um, the, the, the point was for them to hear the word. And, and this is spoken all over in the, in, uh, in the Old Testament, um, especially in, like in, in, uh, in Jeremiah, you know, I, I believe it's chapter 7 or 8 or something where he says, you know, what was, what was required of you that you obey my voice, that you hear my voice. Uh, and so that's what, so, so throughout, they have this marvelous order, a you know, great order of an army. And they have this really well-structured worship that we've already seen through Leviticus. Mm -hmm. And yet, what is the main thing that God wants from them is to listen to his word that gives them rest. Um, so that's that. So, so yeah, it's the center of their lives. And, you know, we see this in, um, in our seminaries. Uh, I know, uh, you went to St. Uh, Catharines, didn't you? I went to St. Catharines. Yeah. I also so you don't have Fort a dog Wayne. in the fight between St. Louis and Fort Wayne, right? Well, I did get my SPM at Fort Wayne, so I spent a year at Fort Wayne. So, um, so when I want to be a Fort Wayner, then I, then I am. Um, but otherwise, I remember someone, uh, someone said, "Well, you're from Fort Wayne, so blah 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 blah." You know, kind of had like a certain uh, preconceived notion about me, and I was like, because I think I was chanting or something. And then he was like, and then I was like, no, I went to St. Catharines. And he didn't know anything about St. Catharines. But St. Catharines is like, is like how Carthage is to Rome. So St. Catharines is to Fort Wayne. It's like, it's more Fort Wayne than Fort Wayne is. That's why I like to say it. But anyway. And um, anyway, so you were talking about the yeah, center of the seminary. Life. Yeah, the center of the seminary is the chapel, right? And it might not, it might not structurally necessarily be that way. I, I But I would say at Fort Wayne, um, it, it certainly, you know, it certainly is. And, and at, at St. Ca St. Catharines, it was, and I know at St. Louis, it is. I mean, you start, you, you, you start your day with, with chapel, right? And then, and then you end it. If you live there, you know, if you're still on campus, you end it with chapel. Yep. Um, and that's, that's a great, it, it, it's such a great, uh, experience to, to go through because it teaches you that discipline. It shows you how, the word of God really is at the center of your life. Um, so, so anyway, um, that's, uh, and uh, you know, just since I'm, since I'm still going down this bunny trail, this is why, like what Luther did with the, with the hours that were meant for the monastery, he domesticated them, so to speak. He made them accessible for the home. And so that's why like today we have, we have matins and vespers, which people are probably most familiar with at going to church. Maybe on the fifth Sunday you do matins, right. um, which you know I, I would prefer just have the Lord's Supper. But you know, um, or or on you know Advent and you know Lent and midweek services you have vespers. You know, right. but and that's that's all great to have matins at church, but matins and vespers should 
we 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 should consider using these at home. Uh, they they they're meant for for the home as well. Um, and so so yeah, that that central position of them all facing the tabernacle. Uh, there's so much there's so much that you can say about that, and it really teaches us that at the center of our lives is the kingdom of God and his righteousness, yeah. which avails before God for us. And that's another thing, too, is what's going on in the tabernacle. The sacrifices, right? Yeah. The propitiation for our sins, uh, the, the, these propitiations that just cleanse the flesh, but they point forward to the true propitiation that God provides in his son, which cleanses our conscience um, and, and makes atonement uh, for our sins forever. And so it's it's a really wonderful picture that's being uh, painted for us here, uh, which really helps describe the whole Christian life as we are in the wilderness of this world. Absolutely. It's a beautiful picture and a wonderful reminder of, of how our lives can be ordered around the Lord and His Word still today in all the ways that, that you described. I would imagine that if you ask your pastor, what does he miss most about the seminary? He's going to tell you, chapel, because that is such a wonderful thing to have our lives ordered around God's Word. But even if you're not on a seminary campus, there's plenty of opportunities to do the same, to order our lives around God's Word through matins, vespers, daily devotions with your family. We're going to keep looking at this text from Numbers 2 more on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Andrew Preuss this morning. We will be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that an investment with Lutheran Church Extension Fund exclusively supports LCMS ministries and church workers? That's right. LCEF ensures LCMS churches, schools, and organizations have access to the financial resources they need to sustain, strengthen, and start ministry work. In other words, you can feel good investing with LCEF because we share your Lutheran values and love for the church. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, September 26th. We're studying Numbers chapter 2, verses 1 to 34 with Pastor Andrew Preuss. He serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in New Haven, Missouri. Pastor Preuss, prior to the break, we were talking about the reality that God has his people camp around the tent of meeting. They are facing the tent of meeting. He is the center of the camp, the center of their lives. He gives very specific directions as to who camps where. And I, maybe it's worth pointing out that the way that it starts is on the east side. I think we typically orient our maps toward the north. Uh, for Israel, the east always takes primary place, and that's where we're going to find Judah. So let's, I mean, there's tons to talk about just with those few details. The east, Judah, the the man who's mentioned, particularly from the tribe of Judah, take us into the first tribe. Yeah, it's funny, by the way, that you said that we typically orient our maps yeah. toward the north, it's because true. orient means east, means yeah. east right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's the rising of the sun. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, it would probably be helpful very quickly just to go through how each standard, there's four standards. Sure. Um, and, and that there's one kind of head tribe for each standard, and then there are two tribes that sort of follow along. So the first standard is, of course, Judah in the east. Um, and then it goes, uh, uh, then it talks about Reuben leading the standard from the south, which is uh, which he leads then the tribes of Simeon and Gad. Of course, then it talks about the temple or the tabernacle and the Levites, you know, who are who 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 are there with the tabernacle. And then on the west side, Ephraim leads Manasseh and Benjamin, which is going to be very important in the history of Israel because Ephraim becomes uh, a great military uh, force um, and even becomes really the main tribe. Uh, in the northern kingdom, as you get, you know, after Solomon, you have uh, Jeroboam who rises up 
uh, and uh, divides the kingdom uh, where, with, with Rehoboam, Solomon's son, in Judah. Uh, and, then, and then on the north side, you have uh, the tribe of Dan, which is interesting because Dan is one of the, uh, he's one of the kind of concubine children, uh, uh, along with Na uh, Asher and Naphtali um, uh, following him. Um, and so, you know, they total the same number. Like I said, uh, it's 603,550. It's the same number because it's the same basic census. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so let's go well, back. Just, to, to just briefly, because you mentioned the, the concubine children, the, the way that the tribes are ordered, generally speaking, is according to who the mother is of the, the son of, of Jacob. So the, mm -hmm. the initial ones are sons of Leah. You do have uh, Gad was a son of, of Zilpa, but then so the, the first two sides, the east and the south, are primarily sons of Leah. The west side, those are sons of, of Rachel. You have Joseph's two sons and then uh, Benjamin. And then, as you mentioned, on the north side, you have the sons of, of Bil Bilhah and then one more of Zilpah. So that's kind of how the arrangement works. Oh, okay. Just no, that, yeah, that's right. That, thanks for pointing that out. That makes more sense. Sure. Now, um, go ahead. So take it. Judas first on purpose, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. So, that, so that's just, you know, to show that you do have... I mean, just historically, it's helpful to see, to pay attention to those standards that you do have these kind of dominant tribes that play the most significant roles. Um, and the main, the main one besides Judah being Ephraim. And that's going to be very important going, going forward, you know, with the division of the kingdom and, you know, you get into first and second Kings and, and first, second uh, Chronicles. But at any rate, uh, what is significant then about Judah uh, is, is, well, where do I start? First, let's start with who's leading Judah. We already saw this in chapter one. Uh, it's uh, Nashon, or how do you pronounce his name? Nashon? Yeah. Just say it confidently, uh, whichever you want. Nashon. Okay, we'll say Nashon, the son of Aminadab. Uh, like I said, he's mentioned in chapter one, and uh, he's the captain of the tribe of Judah. Uh, now, in Numbers 10, uh, verse 14, it says that Judah set out first when they left Sinai. And so they're going, I suppose they're going east, you know. Um, uh, but but uh, uh, Aminadab then is, is also then, uh, it, it should be pointed out that he's a direct ancestor of Boaz and of Obed and then of Jesse and then David, and you know where that goes, right? So in other words, he's a direct ancestor of Christ. Um, and this is obviously very significant. Um, and it's significant that Judah is, like you said, oriented in the east, right? He's camped in, on the east side, which is, of course, the place of the rising sun. And so like in Revelation 22, 16, uh, Jesus just kind of pops in and reveals himself and says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you that the, uh, to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright uh, morning star. Um, and, uh, and so, so this, so this, you know, we have that reminds me of that hymn, how lovely shines the morning star, or if you're in the LSV, it's oh morning star, how fair and bright, but I would, I'd recommend TLH uh, translation, I think is, I think is better. But at any rate, that, that morning star is what we're looking towards, right? So, so on the one hand, we're all looking inward right. in, 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 in the center. We're all looking to the center, which is the glory of God when they're all at rest. So Judah is not being looked at as like, a, like there's nothing special about the tribe of Judah in and of itself, right? right? It's, it's, it's the promise that the scepter will not depart from Judah, as we see in Genesis chapter 49, that the king, Shiloh, the Messiah is going to come out of the tribe of Judah, um, but uh, and uh, but but in the meantime, they're all looking they're all looking toward the tabernacle. But then, once the glory cloud leaves that bright glory cloud going toward the east, then they follow the way of the rising sun, um, and and that, that so they're being they're being led by Christ. They're being led by the bright and morning star um and that that and and that is and and that is that that star who is coming out of 
of Judah. Um, so, so there's there's a lot to uh, once you when you recognize that, then that's the other kind of main detail that you need to know throughout throughout the Old Testament in order to understand uh, the the scope of the Old Testament. What is the goal? What is the the goal of this account? Is uh, of course we know that the that the goal here is that they would go into the land of Canaan. They would right. they would possess the the promised land that God promised to Abraham, um, but but uh, but the main the main details throughout all this is that one God dwells within them; he, d- or he dwells in their midst, which we've already talked about. But also that we're following the seed uh, that God said would bless all nations. We're following that scepter of Judah, um, and we're going to see this manifest Himself. Uh, through the, the the line of David, mm. um, in 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 various in various ways, and then through the various promises and shadows uh, that that arise. But this is a, a significant shadow uh, to to pay attention to. Um, and yeah. when you understand these kind of main outposts um, or main handles um, of detail then it makes it easier to read the rest of the Old Testament and kind of know what you're looking for. And it's not just a bunch of random stories that are not really connected. This is really an important detail that Judah is in the east because the morning star is coming out of Judah. Yeah, yeah. And not not all of the significant figures in the Old Testament come from the tribe of Judah, of course. But anytime we hear about someone from the tribe of Judah in the Old Testament, that's a moment when our ears should be alert and be looking for some kind of preaching concerning Christ. And that is a very helpful way of, like, why is this in the Old Testament? Well, it's often pointing us toward the line of Christ. Perhaps the the most striking example of that is, is in Genesis chapter 38 of Judah himself, when you hear about Judah and Tamar in the middle of the, the account, really, of Joseph, there's this one chapter about Judah and Tamar, some, some rather uh, scandalous details that happen in his life. Why is that there? That's because that's the line of Christ that's being described. So any anytime Judah or one of his descendants shows up, it's very important. It's not an accident. He's camping on the east side. He's mentioned first. He even has the most people listed in his company. That was something that we saw as well in chapter one. I don't think that's an accident either. And just as, as you were describing, you know, the role of Judah here and how that points us to Christ, I was reminded of like Ephesians chapter two, in which Christ is the cornerstone of the church. So, I mean, you think about Israel as the church. What's the central aspect? The cornerstone is Christ, and and so by having Judah first, I think that too points us. To, to the Lord Jesus and, and who we are as the church. Where's our cornerstone? It's the Lord Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, um, what, what's his name? Is I think it's uh, Bezalel, or Bezalel. Uh, was oh, the, the, one of the craftsmen for the yeah, he tabernacle? Was the main, yeah, the main craftsman for the tabernacle, and he's from the tribe of Judah as well, yeah. which, is, which, you know, that, again, showing that the one who comes out of Judah is the one who will build the house, right? Um, the Lord himself will build the house. The son of David will build the house. And so, yeah, I mean, like you said, not every character comes out of Judah. In fact, really, we don't really see many heroes um, of Judah until, you know, until David, you know, uh, I can't, it's throughout the, the book of Judges. I. I I thought I paid attention to this before, but I really can't think of anyone of these heroes in Judges who is from Judah. I could be wrong. If you could think of one, then uh, I'd be interested. But but I but I do think that that is significant. That it's not the, again the point of Judah. There's nothing inherently great about Judah. It's not like it's a pure bloodline or anything like that. In fact, as you just pointed out, if anything, it's a it's a more defiled bloodline mm-hmm. because it was, you know, part of that uh, part of that bloodline in, in, includes Perez, who was born uh, by her mom pretending to be a prostitute and sleeping with uh, with with her father in law. Right. <laughs> um, so I mean, it's it, this is Christ comes to to cleanse 
uh, our our defiled blood by his own blood, uh, and he he assumes for himself um, flesh and blood, and he takes on not that you know he's obviously knows no sin, but he takes on the likeness of sinful flesh, and and so we can see that that Judah is not Judah doesn't stick out uh, in any heroic kind of way. I mean, the greatest thing that Judah himself did was he, as opposed to Reuben, who said, hey, if we don't bring Benjamin back, then you can kill my uh, two sons. <laughs> but then Judah comes and he says to Joseph, before he knows that he's Joseph, he says, please take me as a slave instead. Right. Um, and so he actually offers himself, which, which, which finally exemplifies the character of God himself. Who would come out of Judah? Um, so we certainly have, you know, Judah did have his. He kind of had that shining moment uh, at the end there. But but again, you don't have many heroes of Judah until right. until uh, David, and then sure. most of the descendants of David, right. and even David himself, have a lot of moral failings. Yeah. Um, and it's only by faith that anyone stands. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It, this is the line of Christ, and when you think about the genealogy, both of these names that you were mentioning, Nasha and Aminadab, show up in the genealogy of of Jesus in, in Matthew chapter one. I would imagine they're in, in Luke as well. the The point of that genealogy is to get you to Christ. All of the people listed, some of them have more sordid stories than others, but they're all sinners. They all need the the cleansing of Christ, and, and so certainly there's nothing inherent in Judah. It's just he's the one that the Lord chooses to to bring the Christ through. Yeah. All right. So let, let's keep talking then. I mean, as you, you go on, you point out Judah's got two companies with him. He also has Issachar and, uh, let's see, Zebulun are with him. Their camp, which again goes first, is 186,400. That's the largest number that we have of the four camps. I find that significant that you start with the largest company, and again, it includes Judah. On the south side, you have Reuben along with Simeon and Gad. I suppose with, with Reuben, he is the oldest of the of the 12 sons of Jacob, and that makes sense that he gets listed first on the on this south side, but I don't know that there's... Is there anything else in, in those three tribes to point out? Uh, Reuben... So, Reuben was... Uh, uh, like I point, I, like I mentioned before, he he was he was the one who said to Jacob when Jacob didn't want them to go back to to Egypt because they wanted to bring uh, they they needed to bring Benjamin back because Joseph wanted to see his brother Benjamin, and uh, and so Jacob is uh, d doesn't want them to go, and so Reuben says, "Hey, you can kill my two sons if we don't." bring him back alive. <laughs> and, uh, and Reuben is also the one who tries to save Joseph, um, kind of relying on his own, on his own wit, because he says, Hey, let's put them down into the, let's put them down into a pit. Um, and he goes back there and they'd already sold him. Uh, what, what's interesting though, is why is Reuben behaving this way? Well, because Reuben had an affair with with uh with one of J uh Jacob's concubines. Right. So it would have been I believe let's see Re Reuben would have been Leah's son. So it would have been like yeah. Rachel's concubine that he had an affair with um on his dad's couch. And so like Reuben is trying to placate his dad constantly. And Reuben is supposed to be the oldest, you know, he's the oldest he's supposed to be the leader, but he's just continually failing. And so he still is given, the tribe is given this honor, as you point out, and being the, the oldest. But Reuben doesn't really, not much is, not much amounts uh, from Reuben. Uh, he ends up on the eastern side of the, or the tribe ends up on settling on the eastern side of the Jordan. And they do, you know, they, that, that this next generation that actually goes into uh, the promised land with Joshua are honorable. Um, but, you know, the, the, the tribe of Reuben ends up getting basically swallowed up uh, by the culture around it, uh, along with Gad uh, and, uh, and 
and the uh, the half tribe of uh, of Manasseh. Right. Um, what's interesting with Simeon is Simeon ends up in the middle of Judah, and she gets kind of swallowed up. You don't really hear about Simeon much after, especially after the division of the of the uh, of the kingdoms. Um, Simeon kind of just sort of disappears. Yeah. Um, and uh, but of course, there's always a remnant. So God is going to preserve his remnant out of all of these tribes. And as it turns out, which is the great mystery made known in Christ out of all the nations as well. Um, so. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's about all I'll say about Reuben. Um, Let, could, let's go ahead and, and keep moving a little bit. We've got about nine minutes here. I, there's a, I know a few more details we want to cover. I, I find it significant that verse 17 describes the tent of meeting setting out and then the Levites with them. We'll find more out about the Levites in the coming chapter. But as we were talking about the, the camp being in the middle, the tent of the meeting is in the middle of all these tribes, even when they set out and within this chapter, it's all described here in the middle of the tent of meeting setting out with the Levites, highlighting once more, the importance of the centrality of the Lord's presence among his people. Yeah, yeah. So there, there may not be more. We've kind of touched on that already. Yeah, so we let, kind let's, of already talked about yeah. that. So uh, then we've got what's left on the, the three tribes on the west side, uh, hel- head, headed by Ephraim. As, as you pointed out, that's going to be significant when we get especially to the divided kingdom, Ephraim being the, the chief tribe of the northern kingdom. And then we also go to then the north side, headed by, by Dan. Uh, talk to us about those two sides that we still have left. Yeah, um, Dan is... it. So the Danites, the only... The only uh, uh, detail that pops up in my head is in Judges, where the Danites uh, fight uh, for this Levite. That there's this there, there's this uh, this Levite who goes with this man Micah, I believe was his name. And what was he from? Bethlehem? Was he from or was he from Benjamin? Um, I think Benjamin, but I'm not positive. Yeah. Well, so he has this Levite who is there to kind of bless his gods, <laughs> bless his, uh, kind of baptize his self-chosen religion, which is how people tend to treat pastors and ministers. Oh, Michael just... was from the hill country of Ephraim. Of Ephraim, oh, okay. okay Judges okay. seventeen one. Okay, so yeah, so you have Dan fighting with him um, and, and taking his, uh, his Levite so that he can bless their household gods. Um, Dan is also, so Dan is down by, uh, he's on the coast, right? He ends up on the coast. Um, uh, but the, the, then there's a, but there's a city of Dan, which is up in Galilee area. Right. Um, and that ends up being a, a place for uh, one of the temples that, uh, Jeroboam sets up. So, but otherwise, I mean, Dan is not the most significant, uh, tribe uh, the, the, again, the only thing I really remember of, of Dan, uh, is that, that story in judges, I believe it's chapter 17 or something like that, where they, they keep fighting over this, uh, this priest, this Levite, um, so that he'll bless their, their household gods. Yeah. I I suppose one, one thing to point out with Dan leading the, let's see, this is the, the Northern side, but they set out last when you look at the the numbers that are accounted for of each of the four sides, the one that sets out first under Judah has the most, so they're in the front, and the one that sets out last under Dan is the second most, so they're in the back. Okay. And although, you know, as we pointed out, it is the Lord who fights, the Lord who is the central part of this life, think about the guarding aspect for the people, to have the most people in the front and the second most people in the back makes sense as you're as you're marching along to to have protection both in the front and in the and in the rear. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean and this shows that you know God doesn't yeah, God fights for them, but he also teaches them too. Right? So God God doesn't just have us sit back and do nothing. He gives us stuff to do not because we're earning anything. He's the one making it all work, but he works through the instruments that he establishes and he wants us to, to, to go through it so that we would learn how he fights for us. So 
God is not, you know, God, God is not, uh, 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 slacking in, uh, showing how big they are, right. In, 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 in really establishing a great army. He has, this is a significant army and it's intimidating. And there's a reason why, you know, the, the, like the Edomites and the, the Amorites and the Moabites are resistant to them. They're like, well, look at this. These aren't just a bunch of nomads, you know, wandering around in, in, in the wilderness. They're, they're a, they're a force to be reckoned with and you can see it and that's on purpose. Uh, and that's some, so it's, so, you know, there, there is a certain earthly glory that God gives them a taste of. Uh, the problem is that as we see throughout the scriptures, they often rely on that, uh, earthly glory instead of upon the words and promises of God who is in the center and who is leading them and fighting for them. Mm, yeah. Now, as as the text concludes, uh, we get the list of all the people again. The number that was given in the census of the first chapter is repeated. The Levites are not included, as their task is different, which you pointed out. As we're getting close to, to wrapping up here, Pastor Price, you have about three minutes. I think it's worth at least spending a few minutes or the, and to, to close on the last verse, that after these instructions of the Lord, the people of Israel did this. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, they camped by their standards, and they set out as the Lord had described. One of the things we talked about in the introductory episode was that in the book of Numbers, you have this compare and contrast between the two generations. The, this one, which will ultimately rebel and die in the wilderness, and then the coming one, which gets to go into the promised land, and, and we often see the rebellion of the first generation and the faithfulness of the second I think it's worth pointing out here at the beginning of the numbers, at least, they're faithful. They are listening to these instructions of the Lord, and and they receive the blessings having an, a life ordered around God's Word. Again, with two, three minutes, help us to wrap things up this morning. Yeah, so there's always a remnant, you know, and and and, uh, and even of, of those who, you know, God, as we'll see later on in, in numbers, uh, how because they disobey God, He he punishes this generation, says none of you will enter into the, the promised land, but your children will. Uh, but there also would have been faithful people, even among those who didn't get to go into the promised land, one of them being Moses himself. You know, there were still faithful people among them. Um, so it's not, you know, we shouldn't get the idea that they were all, they all apostatized. You know, Paul warns about, you know, like in, in 1 Corinthians, is it First Corinthians ten that they, uh, you know, that they 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 were left dead in the wilderness? He's not speaking of every last one of them. There were faithful fathers and mothers who taught their children, um, and and that remnant is is always there. Also, keep in mind that there's this happened, this already happened on Sinai with the golden calf and how lots of people had to be had to be killed, um, but then there was uh, there was a fruit of repentance. And so hypocrites will often go along with that, and then they end up showing their true colors as well. So, but just as just as uh, not everyone is truly faithful at heart, when you are seeing the kind of the faithful prevail uh, over the, the the rest of the culture of the congregation. So, in the same way, when you see examples of the unfaithful prevailing, that doesn't mean that every single one of them was unfaithful. And this is part of the great theme of scripture is that God's always preserving his remnant. And it is, and it's, and he's, he's pruning, um, and, and, uh, testing, uh, throughout. Pastor Andrew Preuss serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in New Haven, Missouri. He's been helping us today to study Numbers chapter 2, verses 1 to 34. Pastor Preuss, thanks for being our guest today. Thanks for having me again. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Numbers 2, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Join us again tomorrow as we read Numbers chapter 3. Thanks for spending the morning with us today. Talk with you again tomorrow.
Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.